Well, now it is time for our featured speaker of the week, featured webinar with our good friend Peter Davies, JigsawTrading.com. Now, there's some benefits of trading the tight, choppy markets of the summer, but uh, we've got Peter here today with a 90-minute presentation. So that's why I said uh, get your pencils and pens ready and take some notes and a good day to you. Peter, how are you, Peter? I'm pretty good, pretty good Eddie. How are you? Okay. Appreciate you coming on at this late time uh, on your end of the planet. No problem. Uh, thank you very much to share this uh, this 90-minute presentation. Uh, now, what we're going to do is uh, I posted in the rooms. It's going to be the join.me slash top step trader. And uh, we're going to go through this uh, with uh, Peter. And uh, if you would like at the end or towards the end, uh, Peter, you can just wink. Give me the wink and I'll... I'll open it up for questions, but sure. if you do have questions, hold off for those uh, until we're done. But uh, Peter, uh, thank you very much. I know it's summertime, mid-summertime, very close to summertime, but uh, you, you know, this summertime we've experienced exactly the summertime chop first early, yeah, like late late spring, early summer. But uh, now we're seeing a lot of differential uh, markets. Um, acting differently and uh, you know it's unpredictable but uh, we'll let you take it from here but uh, ladies and gentlemen Peter Davies okay so thanks Eddie and thanks everyone for coming as uh, Eddie said we're gonna look at the pros and cons of trading this summertime chop now we're going to discuss also the skills that you're going to develop during a summertime of chop if you decide to trade it that are going to help you for the rest of the year we're going to look at the jigsaw tools and how they're going to help with specific things you can look at to get in and out of the market. Now it doesn't mean you need jigsaw tools to trade this uh, chop, but as I point out very specific things to look for, it will be using those tools. So the goal today is to give you enough information so that you can sit down in front of a summertime market and actually give it a go, even if it's just on sim, to see if you're suited to it. So we're going to show you how to use the specific characteristics of a summertime market to your advantage. Now once you start to focus on this sort of action, you will actually notice that this sort of action occurs very often. So the sort of ranges that form in the summertime most of the time actually occur all year round, but just not as frequently. So you're going to become skilled at recognizing the shift from the trend mode to consolidation mode if you sit down and watch these summertime markets and how they form. Now I will say as for all my webinars I personally trade the E-mini S&P so my examples are going to be based on that. It doesn't mean this doesn't apply to other markets it's just what I trade. Okay so what is the summertime chop? So I'm going to presume that we have people in the room that have not traded through the summertime yet. So maybe new traders that could be struggling with some of the small ranges we're seeing right now and perhaps wondering what's wrong with the markets. So the first thing we're going to talk about is what's going on. So first of all, it's the summertime in the US and people go on holiday. So there's a lot of talk about the markets being some kind of big robotic HFT battleground. But the fact is when humans go on holiday, the volume drops and it drops dramatically. So it's very quite possible at this time that Robbie the trading robot is actually in for an oil change. Now the holidays are going to last until the week of Labor Day, which is the first Monday of September. But things might not pick up that week. It's usually the following week when you can rely on some kind of normality in terms of volume. Now as we've discussed in previous webinars we've done on Top Step, for markets to move, market orders must eat through limit orders. So we've also discussed the fact that the amount of liquidity or limit orders in the market is the primary driver of the personality of that market and liquidity has got an inverse relationship with volatility. So if the liquidity in a market drops by 50% then it will absolutely be more volatile. Also if those liquidity eating market orders drop significantly there's going to be less eating of limit orders and therefore there will be less volatility and that's exactly what's occurring in the summertime. The volume goes down and interestingly a lot of the time the liquidity itself remains the same or increases so you actually have more limit orders in the market and less volume. 
and that combination causes the very tight trading ranges that you can see lasting all day now if that terminology confuses you go back and have a look at the earlier webinars we did on top step and it goes through all the liquidity the volatility the and that and it's uh, I think it was called introduction to water flow the webinar we did so basically the markets going to be really slow painfully slow um, with low volatility the markets obviously going to give up fewer ticks there is less opportunity there now we have experienced some of this chop already this year um, if we look at last week and early this week okay uh, but also early in July too so since July we've actually been up and down volatility wise and it has to be said so far we've actually had it really really good this summer in terms of volatility okay partly we can thank the situation in Ukraine for that uh, because we keep getting unexpected news releases and that's kind of helping to keep the volatility up so if we look at last week um, you know, we saw a slowdown at the start of July, but then it picked up. Last week, 12th to 17th of August, it was slow until Friday when, out of the blue, we got news that Ukraine had attacked Russia, and then we got the volatility again. This week, Monday and Tuesday, was slow. Yesterday morning was slow. Then we had the FOMC in the afternoon. Volatility came in. So we're going to see more chop through early to mid September, but at any time we can still see a news-driven break, kind of just to keep it interesting. And this is typical of the sort of action we can expect. So this is the 7th of July, 2014, 10.30 a.m. We're one hour into trading. Now we've had a push down from the open, and then we've gone sideways for 30 minutes. Now if you look over on the volume profile, look at the volume traded at each price here. This is excessive at each level. So we can see a lot of volume traded over very few prices. Liquidity itself isn't low. If we look at the limit orders here, we've got plenty of limit orders. And just by the size of each trade at each price, we can see that those limit orders are not pulling out of the way. They're actually absorbing the buying and selling, hence all the volume at these prices. So if the liquidity was lower, if we didn't have those limit orders there, we would actually see a lot more volatility, less contracts traded per price. Okay. Now this small range here, played out for about 30 minutes and as you can see from the chart it hit the extremes of that range a number of times so there's eight hits of the extremes on the 600 tick chart which translates into 16 opportunities you could have taken a point out of the market now of course if you were sitting down watching a 15 minute chart and like a 200 EMA you're probably not going to see any opportunity and you would most likely be looking at this at a market with no opportunity at all now when this lower range was kind of done, we popped up, built a smaller range above before we started to drop it back down. Uh, total move for this first area is just 20 ticks. Now what's also worth noting is that we poked down through this blue line, this is the overnight low, and we couldn't hold that. We popped up through the lower extreme of Friday's range. Now Friday was a half day, these two green lines of Friday's range, you can see it's a very, very small range. And then we rolled over. Now, <clears throat> now on normal days where the volatility is normal buyers would normally jump on a rejection of the overnight low from above <coughs> and sellers would jump on a rejection of yesterday's low from below so whilst it's rangy it is still reacting to common levels but not in the sense that it initiates a new short term trend more that it just gives us um, places to fade places that could become short term range boundaries Okay. Oh, sorry, go back. So on a on a normal day, normal liquidity, you could have hit those two levels in the first 30 minutes, and they would have been a lot further apart. Now, if we look at the NQ up here, we can see the same thing as the ES. We have this lower range, then we have a a, a breakout, and a range higher above, and then we fall back down. And lots of traders are watching this sideways action, waiting for something to happen. But there's other traders that are actually making gravy, fading the extremes based on what's happening here. So while some people are thinking there's nothing going on, other traders are pulling out ticks at these extremes. And of course, they're losing ticks when the range breaks. And it's sort of like one man's inaction is another man's action. And that's exactly what we're going to look at today. How to turn yourself into a trader 
that can actually take advantage of this type of action and make money out of it. Now, there's some good points and bad points to trading this sort of action. People new to the summertime, in their first summertime user phrase, you hear it a lot, I got chopped to bits. But they don't really understand why. They don't really understand what's going on. There's lots of people that sit the summer times out, and I, I myself usually go on holiday at this time. But I, you know, this year I actually took a vacation earlier, so I used to kind of sit the summer time out. The U.S. market's open in my evening, so in the summer time, if I'm if I'm at home, I'd turn on the PC, watch the first 30 minutes. If it's dead, switch it off because it looks like another slow day. So I myself had no strategy for this market. Now as my trading developed and I started to trade more off the volume profile, it was sort of a natural progression to try and break the back of this summertime action. It was almost um, a personal challenge. So one summertime, I decided to just sit down and see if I could actually find an edge in the action. And this is a trader that, that mostly relied on the ES putting in kind of 8 plus point intraday swings and entering on a retracement, which is completely impossible if the market's only going to move five points a day. That strategy just doesn't work. So it turns out with the right approach, the summer isn't all bad news. So here's my review of the pros and cons of trading this sort of action. The first and biggest advantage is that the markets are more predictable during the summer months. Obviously, we can't predict Ukraine attacking Russian trucks. Okay, So even if you don't like the specific action, you have to admit that most days in the summer are fairly predictable. You don't have to spend a lot of time in the summertime deciding if the market's trending or chopping around. And that's important because when you trade a trend, you need to apply the complete opposite approach to trading a range. So the easiest trade in a trend is a pullback, but in a range, that same location is the middle of the range, and where the POC, point of control, or highest volume price is. So with a range, the worst location to enter is in the middle of the range. So the best location on a trend entry is actually the worst location on a range. So in effect, range trading, say again, requires the opposite approach to trend trading. So on non-summer days, I will spend a lot of time trying to decide what mode the market's in. Is it trending? Is it chopping? And it's not just, is it trending today, is it chopping today, it changes hour to hour. So one advantage of the summertime is predictability. So even with the additional uncertainty this year, it is still fairly clear. So it's been a case mostly of one extreme or the other without a lot of ambiguity. So if you take a look at Friday the 15th of August, compare it with the days before and following it, you will see a massive difference. <clears throat> and obviously what we won't see on the charts was what came out on the newswire. Now markets do slow down and speed up all the time, so if you learn how to recognize these high volume at price, small volatility ranges and how to trade them, you can trade them any time they occur during the year. So at Christmas time for instance. So when everyone else is saying this market is useless, this market is rubbish, you can be carefully picking off ticks. And 2003, for those of you training 2013, sorry, we had some very, very, very painful slowdowns the market would just slow down to a call many many times in 2013 and yet we could still trade those. So to me the best reason to give at least one summer a shot at trading, if it's not for you you'll absolutely find out. If it is for you it's a skill you can call on all year when many traders are scratching their heads when the volatility drops. Now another advantage with a slowdown, obviously, if the market's slower, you have more time to make a decision. The market's not going to run against you 10 ticks in a heartbeat. Now of course, news can make that happen, but generally speaking, the market's going to be slower. It's going to give you more time to make a decision about both entering and managing a trade, both of which we're going to look at today. Now slowing down also reduces the risk when you're actively managing a trade and your maximum risk or stop loss is actually going to be close to your entry point. So that's probably a bit confusing, but basically what I mean is you can get out of break even sometimes or with a small profit if you don't like the action. You don't have to wait for your stop to be hit. And with the slowdown, that sort of post-entry analysis is something you have more time to do. 
Now the market still respects key levels and it is more of a faders market. So playing the levels for at least an initial bounce is a higher probability. On the downside, the market will often trade a whole day without going near a level. So if you've been looking at my pre-market prep this week, I've sat down, I've done my pre-market prep and the market hasn't gone near, you know, market's not gone any near, near any of my kind of pre-day levels. So if you're waiting for levels to get hit, very likely you could wait all day. Now obviously trades have got less potential reward. Um, in some cases the range is going to be too small to trade, so I'm not going to get in if I'm looking at less than 3 ticks profit. Okay, which means at least a 4 tick range. That's a personal thing, so if you can consistently pull out 2 trick trades, 2 trick trades, that's fantastic. It's just not something I do. Now the impact of commissions is also something you've got to consider. So if you take range trading to an extreme and you trade a range where you had a one tick stop and a one tick star target and a four dollar commission on the ES, your winners are going to make eight fifty per contract and your losers are going to lose sixteen fifty after commissions. So you'd actually need to a win ratio of sixty six percent to break even. So this type of trading actually should be higher win rate anyway. But needing 66% to break even is a bit much to overcome. So basically that's why I come up with this rule. If I can't get three or four ticks, I'm not really interested. And of course you need to be patient. And you know yourself if you're the patient type or not. There's lots and lots of times you'll put a limit order in to go long. You won't get filled. And then you'll see the market go up five ticks without you. And the problem is with that, you can't chase the trades. Because if the market goes away, proves you're right, and goes up two ticks, you're no longer in a good position from a risk-reward uh, basis to take an actual trade now. Now, the other downside, uh, to some extent, is sim trading. There's a lot of reliance in this sort of trading on getting filled on a limit a lot of the time. And the sim trading is going to be less accurate. So I know Ninja has two mo modes of filling you on sim. One is unrealistically good, and one is unrealistically bad. This isn't really a fault in the product, but a lot of the sim products aren't really meant to be accurate for fills. But I would advise simming it initially, but you've really got to respect the fact that you're not going to get the same fills in a live market that you would on sim. Okay, so what we're going to do now, we're going to look at the components of order flow that you're going to use on these choppy days. We're going to look at some screenshots from 7th of July. Now at that point, my presumption was that we were already in the summertime chop based on what had been happening earlier that month. Now we're going to look at some of the components of the jigsaw tools and at the same time show you examples of what to actually look for. If you have other order flow tools, you should be able to recognize uh, these particular components in those tools. Now what we're going to look at first is this window over here. Now there are two main reasons for creating the jigsaw tool, so I'm going to consider the first one. The CME give us a level 1 feed, and that's what drives the time in sales. Now before October 2009, the CME would give us one line on time in sales for every market order submitted. So if some big trader put in a 500 lot, a 500 lot by market order, then that would appear on the time in sales as a green print with 500. And remember, market orders eat liquidity. Now in October 2009 the CME who own most of the other US futures markets changed the way trades got reported. So now we see one print on time and sales for each limit order a market order is filled against. So in layman's terms the CME splits up large trades so we can no longer see them. And this was done according to them to give a more accurate picture of the market. So now when Mr. Big puts in a 500 lot by market order and it gets filled against 500 one lot retail sell limit orders, you're going to see 500 one lot green prints on the time and sales. Well of course you won't see that because you probably only have room for 50 or so trades on the time and sales screen. So what you'll see is a blur of 10 pages and you won't know if it's 5, 10 or 20 pages, you won't know if it's all buys or sells, you really won't know what's gone on. So the first little helper tool here at the bottom right is something we call reconstructed tape, very very simple. All it does 
is reconstructs the large market orders that the CME split up. So we can see the original order submitted and not the fill. So if Mr. Big puts in a 500 lot order, we'll see a single print on here with a 500 on it. Now seeing large size on your side is a great help. Okay, so obviously you want to see the large size on your side. If the market comes back against you, you want to see it come against you without too many large trades against you. Now, as it turns out though, and sort of unexpectedly for me, for helping you enter, the thing that is far more interesting is stuck large traders. Now, as we can see in this image, we've had size hitting into the bid. So hitting into the bids, the bidders are buyers. If you hit into the bid, you're a seller. The bidder is liquidity. If you hit into the bid with a market order, you're consuming the liquidity. And it's that liquidity consumption we're interested in. So we've had bids hitting in and moving the market down. So we can see we've got bids at, we've hit the bid at 7350, 7325, 73, 7250, all the way down to 7225. We've got some fairly large sellers. And also, there's not really a lot of green in between. So we can say that's a seller dominated market. We have size pushing the market down. Now at this point, okay, move on. Now we can see, just moving on, is we've got another couple of orders, so 107 and 150 selling into 72. At this point, I'd like to just talk about a piece of conventional wisdom, okay, that everybody knows about trading. And the thing that everybody knows about trading is that all ES traders have eight tick stops, okay. I know that because I've to been told that by lots of traders. There's even a guy that chases me around on my YouTube channel telling me I'm talking nonsense because everybody knows traders have eight tick stops, so it must be true. But I've also got a friend who trades 500 lots. He has very, 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 very low commissions, obviously, almost free. He doesn't use eight tick stops, okay? He's looking for a tick, a single tick on his trades. Now, that's not the game I play, but what we need to consider is that lots and lots of people have got lots and lots of different holding times and trading for lots and lots of different reasons, and we need to understand the behavior of some of the people behind these large trades. So it's not like we can say that every big trade is a short-term scalper that's going to exit quickly if you can't get a fill. But be aware these people exist and they do react, as we all do when things aren't going our way. Which brings us to the point about watching these big guys. We're now 1 minute and 41 seconds into the market. We had a lot of trading at the open, so we can see this size here, this size traded around the open, and the bulls couldn't hold it. We can see 3,689 sold into the bid at 73.25. Okay, we're going to talk more about this later. So the bidders, the buyers tried to hold it at that point, they lost, sellers stepped in, push it down to 72. So if you're a seller right now, you're feeling pretty good. We have 444 contracts on the bid, so there's not a lot of bidders in the way to stop the price ticking down right now. There's not much liquidity in the way. Okay, so let's just move on slightly. So how do the sellers feel now? Well, there's still not much liquidity on the inside bid. There's still only 337 contracts to eat there. Now we did tick down to 71.75 because we can see that 22 contracts sold there. It's not a huge amount. And we can also see uh, three more large sell market orders. Okay, we've got 100 contracts, 179, 250. And the result of this additional selling was absolutely nothing. So just from the perspective of this view here, this reconstructed tape showing trades of 100 contracts or more, we can see that big sellers are no longer 
getting any more action for their efforts. They're no longer getting any more price progression for their efforts. And what you're going to see occur at key points is you're going to see a regular pace. If you're a tape reader, if you watch time sales, you'll see a regular pace of sell, 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 tick down, sell, 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 tick down. Then you'll see sell, 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 nothing. Sell, 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 nothing. Sell, 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 nothing. And then the sellers realize they're trapped. And the next thing you're going to see is buy, 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 buy. So there's an appreciable pause. So what I would recommend for anyone that wants to try tape reading is turn everything off, just watch this single window, and get a feel for when the size, when those big traders are getting trapped. It's good exercise in itself just to do that. Just watch the big trades, watch the ebb and flow, watch them when they pause, when they kind of take a step back, they can they, they, they take a step back, they're no longer hitting it, they hit it a little bit more, it doesn't get anywhere. They can see they're offside. You can forget the small trades entirely. Now, any time there is a pause like this, there's every possibility that sellers come in and hit it and sell some more. But the longer this, the longer this lasts, when you get two, sometimes three minutes, as long as three minutes, you get this this kind of move down and nothing happens. The longer that happens, the more nervous the sellers are, and the higher probability of reversal. Now, in addition to this, if you see some buy market orders in we've got one here 7225 if we see some buying come in or if it ticks down and can't stay down as it did here came down to 7175 but came straight back up or if there's an iceberg against them the chance of reversal here is better because what you're seeing in terms of the other side coming back in and having a little try or the bidders resorbing the guys who are selling it down can see that as well and that's going to make them even more nervous. So what we've got here, we've actually got an iceberg. We've got another little large trader stepping in. We've got where it ticked down 71, 75 and couldn't stay. So those are things that the sellers don't want to see. Now, we're going to talk about fading these moves. We're going to talk about going long off this. I just want to make sure we all agree on the topic of fading. This is in the context of choppy, low volume action. So I'm not a fan of trying to catch the high or low of the day. So after an eight point move down, I wouldn't be looking to fade this. Okay, I'm only looking to, I'd be looking to fade this kind of action in a pullback. I'd be looking to fade this sort of action in a rangy market. I wouldn't be looking to fade this action if the market's just moved down rapidly 10 points. So anyway, watching larger trades helps us. You want them on your side when you're in a trade and you want them trapped when you're entering. So that's pretty much what I would use this reconstructed tape for on choppy days but that isn't the only interesting thing that we can actually see on this screen now before I talk about the other interesting thing and the thing that's going to help you a lot in range band markets let me tell you why this screen here this kind of crazy one with all the numbers on why this exists it's called the depth and sales now when I was learning about order flow scalping and how prop traders operated it became really clear to me that I personally lacked some of the mental skills that these guys had. So it seemed to me that these guys that could sit down in front of and trade off X Trader Dome or CQG Dome were what I'd call mental acrobats. They had a really good short term memory for numbers. They could remember what traded at a price five prices up five minutes ago, they could remember what bids there were at a level five minutes ago they could then figure out whether the bids have gone up or gone down and the thing is I couldn't do that it's just I'm not wired that way so basically I designed the layout to get over that need to be a mental acrobat and these kind of mental acrobatics weren't even about making trading decisions it was absolutely just about being able to absorb data so I figured if you took away the need to be a mental acrobat to read the thing it would level the playing field in terms of being able to use the information to make a decision. So if you look at this screen, first thing you should say if you've seen X Trader or CQG Dome or Ninja Dome, you're going to say, how did you make it easy to read when you added more numbers to the screen? Or you might say, there's no way I can read all those numbers at once. And you would be absolutely correct. There is no way you could read all of that at once and you're not supposed to. So what I'm going to do now is very quickly tell you what's on the screen for those who are new to it and then we'll go into the details of what we're seeing on the screen. Okay, so what we're going to look at first, these center columns are something we call current trades. 
red for sell market orders hitting the bid, blue for buy market orders hitting the offer. Now by current we mean this time round. So these numbers are not cumulative. If we move away from a price and come back, those numbers are going to reset. Now those numbers you can also reset manually, which is something I've done here. We've got buttons to reset all, reset above, reset below. So when the market completes a swing low and starts moving back up, you might want to clear what's above you so that you're building numbers onto a kind of a blank canvas. So right now we can see 744 buy market orders have hit the offer this time around and 1801 sell market orders have hit the bid this time around. Now in terms of what to look at, these are the two things that I watch the most. So for me, I watch these columns because they move and I don't go off and read email or browse the web. I just watch these. I try and stay in touch with the market just by watching something that's actually active all all day. Um, it's not like watching a five minute chart. You can watch a five minute chart, it doesn't move. Okay, it doesn't move, doesn't mean just watching it, you would kind of lose focus and lose your connection to the market. So I just watch that, just gives me a connection with the market. As we come into a key area or something changes in the way these two columns are acting, then I'll take a glance around uh, the large trades on the reconstructed tape and some of the other columns. So most of the time, all I'm watching are these numbers here. That's me. Other people do different things. The dome is no different from price charts. Lots of people take triggers off different things. Um, but what I never try to do is watch everything at the same time. I already knew, uh, as I say, I wasn't a mental acrobat. Then the next outside set of columns uh, are the bids here in blue and the offers here in red. That's the liquidity that has to be eaten by these market orders. So right now we can see 337 contracts at the bid and 366 contracts at the offer. Looking down, we can see slightly more bids than offers overall, but at a low of the day, that is to be expected and, and doesn't mean anything. Uh, we can see that some bids are highlighted here um, because I set bids and offers above 1500 to be highlighted, so it draws my attention to where they are. The next outside set of columns is what we call the snapshot. This shows the total change so far in bids and offers since we last ticked up or down to a new bid offer level. So a positive number like this 1536 here means contracts have been added and a negative number means contracts have been pulled or subtracted. So we can see 1536 have been added to the bid 1,098 have been added to the inside offer. The other numbers you can see are just insignificant. So I normally filter out changes of less than 100 contracts and I'm not really interested in the snapshot outside of the first four rows. It doesn't matter if somebody's pulling contracts at 70. It doesn't really matter to what's going on uh, in the here and now. Now the next outside set of columns is the total trades at bid and total trades at offer. So it's similar to current trades, it tells you what's trading, although it never resets. It's not current, it's not just this time round, it's till you, since the market opened or since you cleared it. So they just accumulate uh, throughout the day unless you use these uh, buttons here to reset them. Over here we have the price, uh, you can see last traded price is highlighted, and then we have a volume profile. Uh, orange is the value area. Yellow is the point of control or POC or highest volume price and the white is the VWAP. Uh, this column here just shows, um, sorry, this, this column here, the empty column shows order information, um, the quantity and position in the queue and finally we have an alert column that you put notes in so you can see I've got the overnight low, uh, I put in a, a, a light, you know, ONL there, I put LIS for line in the sand which is my way of saying it's significant price. Uh, we've got the open price and these X's are used to denote where there was high volume in the overnight session. So that's what's on there but we said something should be making these nervous sellers. Okay, And I know a lot of you will already see what that is. So what we can see here, the bid is fairly small. On the previous slide we had 444 contracts on the bid. On this slide, 337 contracts but 1,801 contracts have sold into that bid. 
Now that's only possible because 1,536 contracts have been added to the bid. So whilst the sellers have been selling all these contracts into 1972, some bidder has been quietly absorbing all that selling by adding to his bids as people traded into it. Now when a bidder is doing this and keeping his displayed bid fairly low, so the 337 is what he's kind of showing, there's a chance that somebody's going to put an order in that exceeds that size. So if somebody put in a 400 lot sell market order, it would then tick down uh, to 71.75. Some of those 400s would trade there, but the guy with the iceberg, or the guy, and it's a program that does it, he's not doing it manually, the iceberg would refresh and then suddenly we'd tick back in. So what we can see with these 22 contracts traded, simply a matter of they exceeded the displayed bid, ticked down, traded and came back up. So this activity is what is known as an iceberg order, a bidder hiding his true intentions, hiding his true size. And the sellers are trapped by this iceberg. The sellers, all these people that sold down all the way to 72, are potentially trapped, I should say, by this iceberg. So this doesn't give you 100% guarantee that that price will hold, but the risk reward on a long trade at this point is very good for a couple of reasons. Now, the first reason this is a good risk reward is because you can actually join the bid. Now, sometimes when they put an iceberg in, they will show 1500 contracts and just refresh to stay at 1500. So that means if you join the bid, you need 1500 sell market orders to trade before you get filled. And in this case, the iceberg was keeping the level about three or four hundred contracts. So if you join the bid here, you only need 400 contracts to trade before you get filled. So you can actually get a good price. You want to buy, there's a chance you can actually buy 72 as opposed to just sitting in 72.25. Now you've got 1,493 contracts bid below you at 71.75. So if you join the bid at 72 and you get filled, your eye is on the bid below at 71.75. So you see, if you see that 1493 contract at 71.75 suddenly reduce inside, you can get out of the trade because you know the bidders are possibly pulling out of the way and that reduces your chance of a successful trade. Now you can do that before it leaves 72. So if you get filled at 72, you watch 71.75, you can scratch that trade without losing a tick. Okay. Now, if it does tick down again, as long as you have six or seven hundred bid there at seventy one seventy five, you can stay in the trade. So, if we do tick down, you can kind of say, well, okay, as long as there's seven hundred there, I'm going to stay in the trade. If they start selling into it, then you know, sell into it aggressively, then you can exit. And now, of course, there's always a chance that, for instance, you see eight hundred bid here at seventy one seventy five. And then a single sell market order for 900 hits that and it ticks straight through you, in which case you exit at 71.50. And that's where, in this case, if I was in here, that's where I'd put a hard stop at 71.50. So you could be at a break even or a one tick loss or, if you're really unlucky, a two tick loss. And the upside is potentially either 73 where this step is in the profile or the high of the day or scaling some at the step in the profile and leaving some on for a runner. Now the other thing you've got going on here is if we look to the left, we can see the XX. And I, already, I said earlier that these X's are where we had a lot of volume trade overnight. So there's a lot of people with positions there. So this XX is just my way of denoting where that large volume occurred. So this is also an area where we're expecting a hold. So it's not a guaranteed trade, but it's good probability, good risk reward. We've got positions there from earlier on. We've got sellers trapped. You know where to get out. It's a typical range fade trade. It's a bit early in the day, but it is a typical range fade trade. Now, you can also buy into the offer when you think the offer is about to break. Okay, so joining the bid is kind of the optimal thing you need to do. It's the optimal trade. Okay, the kind of suboptimal trade is hitting into the offer. So I can at any any point put a market order in and buy into the offer. So we can see before we had the iceberg at 72 and at that point you could hit into the offer at 72.25.
So it's a tick worse entry, but if you think it's going to move up without giving you a fill at the bid, then you take it. Now, also, if you see the offers start to pull out of the way, then regardless of what occurs at the bid, it's about to tick up. So it doesn't mean it's going to guarantee you stay up, it's just tipping the odds in your favour. So in this case, this entry hit into the offer at 72.25. Now we can see what happened is that as it was at 72, the bid was 72, the offer was 72.25, we could see some large size, large guys hit into 72.25. And that's what initiated the offers pulling out of the way. So in this particular case, these buyers came in and it was like, okay, well that 72.25 is going to break. No point sitting on the bid waiting to get a fill. If I want to take this trade, I'm just going to have to take the offer price. So you buy into the offer price when it's about to break and then it's going to go give you a tick up. You don't buy into it just because you don't think you're going to get a fill on the bid. You buy into it because it looks like it's going to break. Now, at this point, though, there's still only 59 contracts on the bid. So it did tick up, and I'm kind of at break even, but I'm at break even with only 59 contracts in the bid. Now, in this case, it did tick down against the entry, but it ticked down, it just couldn't hold any. It ticked down and jumped straight back up. Stay there for a minute, ticked down, jump straight back up, stay there for a minute. So there was no real danger after entering on this one, but it did tick against. So you can't. You know, you can't just exit the trade just so it ticks against you in this scenario. You want to see it tick against you and trade and hold uh, before you start to panic. Okay, and this is where we got to. So we can see the reaction that we want on the tape. We said we wanted to see size on our side. Okay, so this is 30 seconds later. We've moved up five ticks from the entry point uh, because basically some of those short term sellers bailed out and they help to drive up the price. So lots of people say, can you tell whether a large trade is somebody initiating or exiting a position? And the answer is no, you can't tell. But when you see sellers trapped at a low like that and then they stay there for a minute and then it ticks up against them and all of a sudden you say, buy, 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 come in. Pretty good chance those buys are actually the sellers bailing out and not new positions. But you never know for sure. So we, anyway, we've got the, the, the large buyers in. We're back up to this step in the profile, just under the open price. Now, for those of you that regularly watch the action around the open price, there's, there's lots of people that don't even think about the open price. You'll know that close to the open time, say the first 45 minutes, sometimes the first hour, the open price is extremely significant. Now, the way I, I kind of interpret it personally is it does appear that sellers really try and keep it below the open price, especially early on. They don't care about it three hours in, right? 15 minutes in, absolutely. The sellers will try and keep it below uh, the open price and the buyers will try and keep it above. But it also appears that when the buyers do push it above, so in this case, the buyers push it above, at that point, the sellers kind of give up. They, they kind of take the foot off the gas. They stop defending. And then the buyers can kind of take control. So it's a pivotal price. Now, I'm at this point, I'm not expecting the market to move through the open price immediately. I'm expecting the sellers to kind of do some magic here and, and kind of keep it down. And there's two reasons for that. First of all, we got this big step. This, this area here where we had this step, 7325 close to the open, we had a lot of people, 3,689 contracts trading to that, buyers tried to hold it, bidders tried to hold it, and they lost, and they bailed, and I'm not expecting them to be so aggressive when it gets up towards the open, so I'm expecting this area to hold, at least initially. Now, one of the hardest parts about range trading is fading yourself. If we look at the the early part today, you know, when when we looked at the the, the one hour picture, we saw there were 16 chances to fade the range, an eight above and eight below. There is a lot of people I know, and I have a problem with it myself to some extent. A lot of people have a hard time going long at the bottom of range and reversing it at the top. It's just kind of like um, a mental block going from long to short. Lots of people are uncomfortable with it. Uh, nothing wrong at all 
was playing the range just from one side. Now this reversal trade is somewhat tenuous because there's no order flow confirmation on the entry. But the thing is, what you do have with this step in the profile above and in a range round market, in a summertime market, you have time to work and exit. And this is a really significant advantage of summertime market. So if buyers continue to hit this, it's still going to take time to get through 73.50. So it's a range bound market. We expect even if it goes against us, it's not going to do it quickly. But when we've got this volume above, it's going to take time to work its way out. And I should even then, if it does tick up to 73.50, I might be able to work my way out of it a break even. Might be able to work my way out of it at less minus a tick. So right now we don't have a well defined range. What we do have is a return to the open. In a, in a market that's going to be range bound, in a slow market, we're expecting a range to form. We're not sure where. We're just three minutes in, but we're taking a shot at this purely because we have time on our side. Now, as it turned out, we did actually tick down from this point, and then another 600 contracts hit into the offer. We'll see that in a second. We had buying at 73. Um, including a, a 200 lot trade. So basically what happened is it ticked down, then t then we saw some size come in, ticked up to 73.25. I saw that and decided to take a break even scratch by putting in a bid at 73. Again, I saw it move against me. We had 73 bid, 73.25 offered. I didn't exit out of that short with a market order. I put a bid in at 73, taking advantage of having time to get a fill, which annoyed me because then I saw this. So what we can see here is we can see those couple of large buy market orders hitting into 73 after my entry. And you can also see the total trades at the bid at 73 uh, went from just over 1300 to just over 1900. You can also see that only seven contracts hit into 73.25. So that scratch of that trade was absolutely emotional, not logical. When it got to 73.25, nobody wanted to trade it. So that's something to take care of. Again, you have time. When it ticks against you, you can watch to see what happens, see if anyone trades into it. Okay, so what I did there, I let these big guys hit into 73, spook me out. I saw them get the tick up. I just saw seven trades con seven contract trade and I exit the trade. Okay, now overall what are we looking at here? We're looking at a failure to get through the open from below. We had big buyers up to 73. Uh, these have now been followed by big sellers down to 72, 75. We have some more big buyers hitting in 72, 75 but right now they're not getting anywhere and what do we see? We see a total of 2,923 contracts hitting into the offer at 72.75. Buyers are trying to push it back up and they're getting trapped. So this 2,923 is another iceberg order, but this time it's on the offer side. So it's the offer side absorbing the buying, but keeping their displayed size again fairly small, 358 contracts. So buyers trapped gives you a short entry. Now you've absolutely got a short entry there, but this is not an ideal range trade. Okay, first of all, the range itself is clearer now. We have a kind of a better shape to the volume profile. Okay, but and the, and the shape you're looking for on the volume profile is basically a D shape. Okay, tapering at the top. The problem with it, first problem is you're entering in the middle of a range, and it is never ever good from a risk reward perspective to enter in the middle of the range. So I have a personal rule against it. But the setup is there. The setup absolutely is a short setup there. So no trade for me personally. But there are some of the considerations. Like I said, the range is well formed. It's fat in the middle. But it's only two points right, wide. So if the range is very small, a range extension is likely at some point. So ranges tend to extend before they completely break. Okay. So a range extension is likely. So if you took a short there, um, you might be lucky. You might look out and say, well, maybe it goes down to, pushes down to 
to 71.25, my overnight low, because again, we said it respects levels, or maybe it pushes to 70.25, uh, that's a line in the sand. Now, the offers are refreshing, but small. So if we offer 72.75, we only need 358 to trade ahead of us before we get filled, so we can get a good price. We've got some size above us that we could sort of lean on, and we, we've got the iceberg. And your risk, well, what's your risk here? Well, nobody wanted to trade 73.25, just got 18 contracts overall. Uh, 73.50 is your open price. So if you get through the open price, you're done. Shorts will bail and longs will push it. So you don't really need to, certainly don't need to have your stop any higher than the open price. But you could absolutely have your stop 73.25, 73.50. Uh, your downside target, a very, very likely 72 and possibly 71.25 you'd be very lucky to get 70.25 so anyway this is painful for me to watch one of the one of the biggest perhaps biggest reasons I didn't take this trade is because I would have been chasing the market um, and I don't think that's I don't think that's kind of a healthy thing to do and then we got to the overnight low at this point my wife has put her head around the door and is asking me who I'm shouting rude names at if you don't swear at your screen when this happens to you, um, I advise you start very soon. Now, it's always good to take a step back. So at this point, what to do? Well, we've progressed down on the ES. If we look at the NQ up here, it's just sideways and, and horrible. That's not giving us any clues. The nice tick is almost completely down, but it's not really, not really made much of a push down to the downside, so not much of a move on there. Uh, we have extended the range. ES is now at the overnight low. We've got a couple of big buyers that have stepped in at 71.50. Uh, we still have sellers down to 71.50. Uh, they're still new, probably not too nervous yet. And it's early in the day. So right now, my, my, my thinking is right now is let it play out. Um, especially because you're at a key level and there could be a bit of manipulation. So... In fact, the best way to start, if you're trading in the summertime, the best thing to do is actually just let the first 15 minutes play out. I personally like trading the open price, but when you start, you might want to let the first 15 minutes play out because at the end of the 15 minutes, the range sometimes looks really, really obvious. Okay, so let's just go to 9.45 and look at uh, the end of a theoretical... 15 minute no trade period. So if you'd wait 15 minutes, come in and look at this, this is what you'd see. And we do have a very well defined range to play. The range itself, the bottom of the range is 71. The top of the range, not so clear. You could say 72.25 or 72.75 as the top of your range. It's, it's a kind of not so clear at the top. Uh, the range is more D-shaped, which is what you want to see. And you potentially have a downward bias looking at the ES chart we can kind of see potentially uh, a downward bias looking at the ES chart the tick is just turning up but barely after being negative so far NQ um, again just below its open here at 30, 39.08 um, cumulative delta is also moving downwards now I would prefer the delta to be flat with this kind of action so right now Looking at this, I want to play the range, but I want to play the range from the top down as I kind of feel it's more likely to break down before it's going to break up. There's just a little bit of bearishness about this right now. So this isn't mandatory. If you're aggressive with this and you play both sides, um, that's fine. But I'm kind of a little bit more cautious. I kind of kind of like to, to play one side if I can see a little bit of bias. Um, there is a very good argument for just playing each hit on the range until it breaks um, and not worry too much about perfecting the entry. Uh, certainly if you saw the range, you know, if you just traded each side of the range like five or six times each side, you could, you know, you could theoretically get a 10, you know, 10 points out of it. But it's just, it's not something I do. I will uh, always look to refine the entry. So anyway, let's fast forward to the range breaking. Now one of the keys of fading the range is being able to spot when the range is breaking. So as I said, you can just put limit orders to fade both extremes of the range and then manage the trades after you get filled. So 
you can hit the range every time it hits an X screen and just write off the range breaking as a cost of doing business. No, no rule that says you have to see that the range is holding before you enter. In fact, if you put the limit orders in early, when price actually gets there, you're in a better queue position with more traders behind you in the queue when you get filled. So again, you have more time for that analysis after the entry. So right now, we're at 10.07. We've had quite a few bounces. And this is me about to get run over as we come uh, to the end of the range. Now, if you look at the chart and the volume profile, the volume profile shows that the range has narrowed. So our focus now is 71.50 to 72.25. That's just a four tick range, three ticks available for a trade, or four if you're really, really, really lucky. But to me, I think three ticks is probably all you're going to get. The chart shows just how many times we've hit the range. If you count this on a 600 tick chart, we've hit the extremes of the range eight times each side. We might have hit it a few more times, but this is this is low down. I go in terms of granularity on the chart. We've got roughly 116,000 contracts traded between 71.50 and 72.25. Now, obviously, this is scalpers' heaven, basically. So a lot of the people that traded here have got in and got out. But this market is still like a coiled spring. The more people, the more this trades here, the more people we have that are still holding positions in this area, and the more people that will bail if the range fails. Okay? So you have to look at these ranges as sort of a living thing that builds energy like a coiled spring. So on this eighth hit or so, this is absolutely becoming a less probable trade. So in normal conditions, when it's not summertime, when a market reverts to a range for like 30 minutes or an hour or so, I'm very reluctant to take anything after the fourth hit. In the summertime, you get a lot more hits, but you have to scale back on the latter hits in terms of size because you do have a good chance of getting run over. Now, you take trades like this solely because of the presumption that you should be able to manage out a decent exit because the market is slower. So if you're the kind of proverbial deer in the headlights and you can't cut trades, then this isn't something you want to do. So in this case, uh, we're at my entry price, not filled. Uh, there's an exit order below um, because I want to get a decent queue position by the time he gets down there. Um, and on the entry, I'm at 323 in the queue. Now, if this sell order doesn't fill and it moves down, I'd actually let this buy order fill and then the sell order becomes my exit order. Okay, so I'm filled. Should be very happy about that. We've only seen, uh, there's been three large traders in the last two minutes, uh, up to 72.25. They have got a tick up. But look at the offers above. We've got uh, 1620 on the offer, 2074 on the offer, 1681 on the offer. And that's a good thing, right? Look at all that liquidity that has to be chewed through um, before we can move up. Well, there's actually a couple of issues with large offers like that. So first of all, large offers almost always, almost always, like 99.9% .9 of the time, appear at the high of a range. So if you're wondering where other participants are looking at this range, so you, you might see, oh, well, Pete's wrong, 70, 50 is the lower of the range, 73, 75 is the high. And I'm going to say, no, absolutely, 72, 25 is the high of the range. And I'm getting that confirmed simply by the fact that the offers are, the offers are immediately above that are high. Okay? It doesn't mean that the range will hold, it's just like a phenomenon of the market. If you're in a range, when you get to the top of the range, you'll know that that's the top because the offers will be stacked. Okay, doesn't mean it's going to hold. But the other issue with big offers like this is they're often there to fool you into going short. Okay, and if offers, if people are stacking the offer there to make you go short, what you're going to see is a specific type of activity on the other side, on the bid side. Okay, so if people are spoofing the market to make you go short, they want you to go short so that they can buy. So we've got bigger offers above, possibly fake, and, and also I can see the bids are kind of firming up a bit. Offers are pulling slightly, no, no real big deal there. Okay, 
So I've decided that I want to get out. Okay, and we'll go through why in a second. So I can see I've got another big, oh no, I think that was there before the, the 201. Now I've decided to get out. Let's first look at what I'm doing to get out. So I've decided this market's possibly going to run against me. So why not exit with a buy market order and lose a tick? 72.50. Well, this is summertime. Markets are moving slowly. So there should be time to make a decision. There's offers there, but I still have 869 offered. So there's no reason to think those offers are going to collapse entirely. So I'm hoping more sellers come in and get fooled into selling because of these big offers above. So my fingers on the mouse here, ready to hit out a market against the 72.50 price uh, if this 869 starts to reduce drastically. So again, I'm going to say it many times with a slow market, you have time to make a decision, you have time to work an exit, time to get at a better price. All those ticks add up. You don't just panic and give up a tick in a slow market because you think the tide is turning against you. So let's have a look what happened. I got a fill. Okay, so in the end, 1037 contracts traded into the bid at 72.25. Now, what should I do now? Should I kick, me, kick myself because sellers came in? Look at these 387, 113, 274. Should I kick myself? Okay, well, if they sell into 72 with size, I'm probably going to kick myself, probably going to break a keyboard. But right now, all we've got that sold into 72 is one lonely little sell market order. So I still see this as a possible attempt at spoofing the sellers into buying. So I've got the stacked offers above. I've got the fact that it's like the eighth attempt at the high. I'm not going to. I'm not going to hold that if I think potentially they're they're spoofing to to break through the top. Okay, so let's have a look what happens. I've just got this one trade at 72, and let's have a look what happened next. So we can see the offers now. The offers are getting it out of the way. We've popped up. We've got some more buyers moved in. Um, the offers are now pulling out of the way, and the bids here are firming, following up. Now, when you see these bids here that are firm, they're firm but not silly. Okay, so when you start moving up and you want to look at the bids behind you, yeah, 1,300, 1,400, 1,300, perfect. 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 behind you, not good, not good. It's, it's spoof, it's fake, it's to, it's to fool other people into doing this. So basically, I got spooked out at the top of the range, saw the offer stacking, saw them absorbing uh, contract 72.25, or 72, sorry, and the market popped up. Okay, now a few minutes later, we can see Mr. Iceberg once again. And this time, it's at the top of the range on the bid side. So this is another potential entry point. So this is a continuation trade. So this is the bidders trying not to let it get back into the range. So the sellers are still trying to fade the range. Okay, the sellers are saying, okay, that was a head fake. Let's go back into the range. But the bidders are kind of saying, no, we're having none of that. Okay. So look at the large. We've got large sell orders in 7250. All those guys, again, that is just a little bit of temporary energy. A lot of big traders selling into a price and not getting anywhere. Okay. So sellers are getting trapped again. And then we pop up. So there's a pause at, back at the open price. So we're back to the open price. And there's a pause at the open price. Not a surprise. 1,542 contracts traded into the offer, 1,444 added. So another iceberg order. The NQ, NASDAQ, has pushed up to the upside and it's way past its open price. So we've had a pop. This is a range day. So the options now are we fall back into the range, we extend the range, which basically means we push up and fall back again, or we have a new range higher up. And at this point, on a, range, on a range bound day, I would presume a head fake, but I would also give it time to show its hand. Okay, so the last range we had basically had a good run. Okay, we've had the opportunity to milk that range. Now it's time to, to step back. So we know the old range was like a coiled spring. We know it wouldn't hold forever. 
if a new range forms, it's going to take 5 or 10 minutes to build enough volume to show us where the extremes of that range are. So basically, now we've pushed out, we just sit back. Just sit back. You don't need to take a trade right now. Sit back. Let it happen. So we are expecting multiple hits of any range. Okay, so we are expecting a range to form and to get multiple hits. So we could fade this now, expecting um, falling back into the range, but we're kind of trying to predict what the market's going to do, as opposed to letting it play out, build a range, and then you know just scalping around that range. So what I'd like to do, just let it play out, see how it reacts if it comes back to 72.50. Or, or let it build a range somewhere else. So at this point in time, we have a total range of 13 ticks. It's tiny, tiny, tiny thin, mar uh, volatile market. Um, but there've been some short-term opportunities for those that are ready to keep risk in check and that kind of nimble, getting in and out. And this is what a typical range day ends up looking like. So this is the 15th of July, top to bottom, just over four points okay and that that would seem very painful if you're watching a, a 15 minute chart now the first thing you can see here is that the best opportunities but the least frequent are for the most um, patient traders so we've got this kind of outer range um, that we that we did revisit multiple times through the day now we also have these smaller consolidation zones that developed intraday and these are the places that you play for ticks. And this is what the summertime chop is all about. Knowing about these areas, expecting them to develop and playing them when they do. It's not for everyone, but the reason we try it in the summertime, the reason we learn this is because the market devolves into this sort of action all year round. And that's why we want to give this a try. And this is opportunity. This isn't the hardest way to train. Now, the summer markets can be directional okay it can be always breaking out to the upside and kind of we end up with a higher day or they can be completely non-directional like this day but they're still characterized by small consolidation zones that effectively break we move out the zone then we consolidate again okay so let's just go over a, a couple of ways you can play the range okay so the first thing is in the summertime you expect the range but you check your volume, your market internals, your correlated markets, and the news, and all of that should be pointing in the direction of low volatility. Now, you're going to use the fact that the market is slow to enter and to exit. So it's often going to let you out at break even. It's often going to come back and give you an exit. So don't just hit out at the market if there's a good chance you can work your way out at limit. Now, the market's going to be slower, and you need to turn that to your advantage. That's what summertime market's about. It's a different market with different characteristics. How do you take advantage of that? Both in your entry, your trade management, and your exit. Okay, that's the key to playing these markets. Um, you don't need to play the ranges in the first 15 minutes. There's a lot of jostling for position then, especially around the open price. Uh, there are trades on, but they're not kind of typical range trades. You've kind of got two like subsets of trades, your, your D-shaped range trades, and then you're kind of battling around the open uh, and relying on it being, giving you time to get out. So you use the volume profile to tell you where the range is. It's where most trades occur, not necessarily where the extremes are on the chart. Okay, So you want to see a nicely formed D-shape on the volume profile. It's going to fail. The range will absolutely fail eventually. We'll move somewhere else and we'll form a new D. That's going to happen multiple times in a day. When the range fails, just wait for another one to form. Now, I said the markets can still be directional. We've seen, uh, I think it was Wednesday, we had a directional range day, or Tuesday. Uh, so a day can consist of tight ranges that always break upside or downside. Now, longer term order flow tools such as Cumulative Delta, they should stay fairly neutral. Okay, so make you make and make sure you check the actual number, not just look at the chart. So a swing of 2,000 contracts on a quiet day could look relatively big because the chart scaled that way, um, but it's actually still quite neutral. And if you do spot a real bias on the delta, you know the delta's coming down 10,000 contracts, then by all means, only play the range from one side. The bids and offers are going to tell you where the range extremes are. So that's uh, your confirmation. Bids will absolutely be high 
at the range low. Offers will be high at the range high. Doesn't mean it's going to hold. It just means the market perceives those prices as the current extremes. It's like a consensus as to where the extremes are. Now it's going to be normal to move one to three ticks to a range and head fake. That's just normal range band behavior. Um, if you see it move through and then you see an iceberg stopping the market three ticks through your range, very, very likely to come back. There wasn't an example on the slides, but kind of three ticks through, iceberg, come back. It's a beautiful trade because you've got that extra three ticks to play to the other side of the range. Um, you know, you might have just got stopped out because you, you, you faded the range high. It pushed through three ticks, you stopped the trade out. But don't let that put you off hitting it again when you see them, def we see definite signs of them holding the market higher up. Obviously, the longer you play the range, the more chance it is of breaking. Um, if you learn summertime trading in the summertime, don't expect the same amount of holds of the range the rest of the year. Uh, your lowest probability to trade is the middle of the range or the highest volume price. Um, and if similarly, if you if you do fade it and you can't get through the middle of the range or the highest traded price, and it comes back to your entry, that probably means the, the range is going to fade or uh, fail. Sorry. Okay, so your entries, just to go over it, um, if you enter with a limit order, you gain a tick on the entry. Um, you're probably going to have five or six trades like this a day, uh, possibly more if you're aggressive. You want to save that extra tick, uh, but sometimes it's not feasible to join at limit because you're just not going to get a fill. So you can enter a limit order at either of the end of the range and just see which side gets hit first. That's going to give you a good queue position when you get there. Um, if you're at queue position 50 when you get there and there's 12 in the queue, you can get filled. And if you don't like what happens, you can just get out while you're still trading the same price. Okay, just use that queue position. Um, like I say, there's nothing at all wrong with putting orders in at the extremes, letting them fill, and then using the order flow of the market internals, the correlated markets, to kind of kill or keep those trades. Now, if you're going to join the limit, um, don't try and join the limit if there's 2,000 contracts there. You're not going to get a fill. Um, the best time to join the limit is when there's like three or four hundred contracts and it's refreshing and they're iceberging it. Uh, with the market orders, the best time to use a market order in a range is when the bid or the offer you're about to hit looks like it's about to fail. So if you want to go long and you've got a 1500 contract bid and a 1500 contract offer, you do not want to hit into the offer. It's not, it's not ready yet. But if the bid's 1500 and the offer is 200 and not refreshing, then the chances are very, very high that the offer will break first. You hit into the offer when you see that two or three hundred. It ticks up, and then you've got time, a bit more time to make decisions. Then you're at break even. Now, in terms of exit points, it's a bit different. Having exit points a little bit different when you're trading range. Um, if you get long and the bids three levels below, you're all two hundred contracts. Chances are price is going to move through that pretty quickly. So going long it doesn't make sense to enter um, if there's no liquidity below you okay liquidity can be fake but if it's like two three hundred below you though that can break pretty quickly so in that case you're better off just letting it break down and getting in at a lower point uh, where there's a decent but not crazy bid below you and ultimately you do need a point to exit and sometimes that's going to be in the conventional wisdom worst possible place for a stop. It's going to be below the low of the day or above the high of the day and common sense says that's where everybody has their stops. It's not ideal but sometimes you're going to be playing the range. Your range is also going to be the range of the day. Uh, especially early in the day when you're, you're actually building the first range and there's really not much you can do um, about that. But what you don't have to do is you don't have to wait for your stop or your exit point to get hit. So if the bids, if you've got bids below you and you're long and they start pulling out of the way and you're still close to your entry price, you can start getting out before it moves against you and before you hit your stop. You don't have to wait for your stop to be hit. Your stop is your worst case scenario. Um, also, if you're long and other buyers come in but can't move it up, so maybe you see some buying, some buying, some buying and it ticks up and then just falls back again, ticks up, falls back again. Again, just exit before it moves against you. Once you're like three or four ticks on side, on side, you can you can just let it do what it wants to do, okay? Um, but if 
you know, they just can't move it up and you close your entry point. Just just get out. Just get out. There's no no reason to stay in it. Now, you do need to be fairly aggressive in cutting a trade when you're close to your entry point. Okay? So if you've just got in and you still start to see signs that it's still going down, because you're going to get in when it's on the way down or when it's just come down. And you might be wrong and it might just be still carrying on moving. So that's you have to be very, very careful uh, of those early trades coming in against you. But once you're in a trade, you've got to remember it is the summertime and it will take time to get to the opposite end of the range. So my tendency is to get in, see that the bids below me, if I'm long, see the bids below me is solid. See there's no absorption on the offer side against me. Get a few ticks on side. And then forget about it, basically. As long as you stay above my enterprise, just let it run. Um, there is an argument for getting out when momentum stops, but to be honest, in the summertime, there's no momentum in the first place. So, you, And you can't really... It's very difficult to gauge one tick every 30 seconds against one tick every 40 seconds or one tick every 20 seconds. Um, if it does keep coming back to your entry and it looks weak as it moves off, and by weak, the best thing to, to spot is the amount of time it spends after ticking up and ticking down. So if it ticks up, spends a minute there, ticks down, spends 10, 10 seconds there and, and ticks up again, that's kind of weakness. So if it keeps doing that, coming back to your entry point, you've got to consider the market's only going to give you so many opportunities to get out. Okay, so if you're in a bad trade, very, very often it will come back and give you a chance to get out of a bad trade. Uh, but it's not going to keep doing it. Um, so basically, these trades are hardest to manage. These trades where it kind of doesn't move up from your entry price quickly are kind of tough to manage because you can't be passive if the price is at your entry point or below your, your entry point. Once you're a few ticks on side, yeah, you can be passive, completely passive in terms of managing that trade uh, because you're on side and you know it's a slow market. Okay, so summertime trading, it's not for everyone, um, but markets slow down. Um, in the summer, they slow down intermittently. It is worth spending time one summer with a kind of new perspective on actually using these characteristics to your advantage. And at that point, uh, we have time for questions. Yes, we do. If you do have any questions, you can put those in the Squawk Radio Room and uh, we'll get to those. All right, so starting out here, we do have a question. Let me scroll up here. We can go with uh, the question from Barrage right now, which was a question of mine also. Um, question, how do you adjust from summertime order flow reading to fall and winter time order flow reading? Um, pretty easy, that one. If, if you've got a decent pace market, order flow is very much about um, pace and momentum and seeing up, 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 down, down, up, 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 down, down. And it's not really about focusing on what hop happens at a particular price. It's like changes over time. Um, so in a normal market, it's, you're looking for changes over time. Whereas when it slows down, you're looking for very focused, specific activity at a particular price. So you don't really care, is it slowing down as it comes to my level? You're just looking at, okay, it's at my level. What's happening? And it might come down to the level below where you thought it would stop. And, and what you thought would happen is going to happen there, but it's it's very more it's very much more focused on activity at a particular level. All right. Um, next question. Question: The big picture. Talking about summertime hours. Now, you know, I've, I've been on a floor uh, for a long time, and you you do notice that. I mean, uh, you, you can uh, see the locals leaving early and so forth, and some of them making those uh, two day weekends, three day, four day weekends. But, uh, you know, as, as far as trading, now, for opportunities, sometimes when there's a lot of volume, uh, at, at times you can't get your price. Uh, you can't get your trade. Or there's a lot above your levels. Uh, you're looking to buy and you've got to get past 2,000 contracts and, and so forth before I hit mine. And, you know, we're always saying, you know, don't chase the market. Let it come to you. Now, summertime hours... Uh, just looking at some of the volume, and, and Peter, I know we've talked a lot about that, uh, where you see the lighter volume on uh, a lot of the highs and lows yep. and uh, trying to get filled there. Now, the, the question is, uh, you, you know, being a trader, is it is it best to uh, try to put your levels in and see if it does uh, slide through as far as the summer hours? What I'm, what I'm trying to say is, 
uh, the volume. Uh, you should be able to be getting your fills a lot easier. The market, we see it do running uh, a little bit more with less volume. The thing is, we're not hitting the brakes uh, when we do have the 2,000 contracts trading there or the 3,000 contracts or, or whatever that we're seeing. But, you know, we're just having 100, 200, 500 contracts trading and moving to the next price. Now, uh, being new to trading, how does one set oneself up for that? Um, well, you, uh, the thing is you can – one of the things that, that most people do is they they learn about the summertime and the wintertime um, by going through a bad experience. Um my experience with the summertime is you actually get more contracts trading per level. Uh, winter time, you know, winter time specifically Christmas and New Year, it's terrible because New Year it's like you know I don't know if it's a cold but it seems a lot more slippery. Um, so you, so summertime thicker, a lot more contract trading per level. Winter time the liquidity disappears, not the not just the volume, the liquidity goes and like it can get pushed around a lot. Um, but I think the only thing you can do. Hopefully somebody makes you aware of it, um, and if not, hopefully you don't get cut up too much at seeing it for the first time, and then you have to you have to adjust whatever. And it it really comes down to how you trade in the first place, as to how you make an adjustment, basically. All right, thanks, Pete. Uh, another question, Barrage here. Um, now remember, if you've got a question, put it in the Squawk Radio Room here. Uh, that goes for our guests. We've got a lot of guests here. And uh, please do not hold back. If you uh, need to know something, just post it here in the Squawk Radio Room. Uh, next question. We've got Barrage here again. Uh, question. Do you find order flow helpful for a market like Euro Dollar Futures? And not much movement there, but lots of size. Yeah, Euro Dollar, Euro Stocks. Um, it's just a slightly different game. It's, it's like the U.S. Treasuries. It's a slightly different game. Um, a few different things going on. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't trade the really, really thick markets because I would go. I think I'd go crazy if I spent all year doing it. Um, but I kind of like the I like the the little ranges that come in. But yeah, you can use order flow. It's, in fact, the Treasuries markets. Um, it's almost exclusively um, people trading off the dome. So the way I see it is if your market is more volatile, charts help a little bit more because you can see all the different inflection points that have occurred through the day. So if you look at crude, you can see where all the swings have occurred and those are always potentially uh, points of interest as we come back to them. Um, with stuff like the, the US Treasuries, the Euro stocks, there's almost there's like one swing for the day. Um, and so the charts don't help and it's really a pure order flow market. All right. Thank you, Peter. Um, Money Penny's got a question. Have you ever tried, uh, have you ever traded EMD futures and is there slippage? I've never traded it, I'm afraid, Money Penny. All right. Uh, next question is S. Uh, Garcada. What does step in the profile mean, and what it's uh, what is its significance? Okay, step in the, the 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 profile is basically the volume profile, and that's the number of contracts that have traded at each price for the session. Um, it's significant when I've got twenty thousand contracts at one price, and then the price below it, I've got three thousand contracts because obviously a lot of people positioned. 20, in that when where, where that 20,000 contracts is and if it breaks down then they're going to actually move out of position and also when I've got like a range of prices four or five prices with like the 20,000 contracts it tends to rotate around that area it tends to just say it's like we're like trading in this area and it will trade around that area um, so that's the significance all right next question is from Jason uh, where's the tape reading tool that you use that looks like a blue and red tape fighting each other? And uh, why aren't you using it? Okay, that's the strength meter, uh, and it's part of the jigsaw tools. I don't use it on choppy markets like this. I, I use it on markets. I use it on an, a, like a normal ES market where it's putting in decent swings. Um, on a market like this, is just. I mean, if you look at it, one of the things you look at, if you look at the cumulative delta for a few days this week, we had, I think it was Monday, the delta went down all day, uh, or went down for a significant part of the day, and the price went up. It's just very, you know, when the market gets into this mode, those tools are very kind of um, misleading. All right. Um, Sarah, uh, S. 
Carcata has got a question. Do you put the range lines on your chart manually, or you use an indicator to calculate? Oh, far too lazy for that. I use a there's a indicator called Price Action Swing on the Big Mike Trading Forum. Uh, you can go and download that for free there. All right, Najib has a question. Peter, great talk as always. Can you talk about the unique way to trade thin markets like crude? Is there any tactics you know of that would apply to crude or any other thin markets uh, versus ES? Would you be afraid to lean against size in the crude dome since it can evac evaporate so quickly? Yeah, I would be very afraid. I don't, I don't trade thin markets. Um, it's just not something I do, so I don't really like to kind of talk about how to do it because I, I don't actually do it. I know people that do it, but I don't actually do it myself, so I don't like to, to really pretend to be an expert in it. Right. Okay. All right. Well, that uh, Peter, that looks like all the questions that we do have today. Once again, I appreciate the time and, uh, of course, your insight. Very happy to have you here. i uh, got uh, one more question here before I let you go. What do you use for the uh, cumulative delta? Okay. I use something called the GOMI tools which are also on the Big Mike Trading Forum, but you have to join the Elite section. I think it's $100, but it's pretty cheap anyway for, um, for the tools. But yeah, you look for GOMI CD, uh, GOMI Footprint on the Big Mike Trading Forum to find out more about that. <laughs> well, there you go. At least you're pointing the right yeah, direction. Yeah, just saying, Wookie. <laughs> Thank you, Wookie. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out how I can... Uh, kick him in the butt but I can't yeah. do it from here he's got to come to the office I can do that but uh, um, all right but uh, Peter appreciate it uh, thank you very much now for our guests here today remember this is a free broadcast we do have Peter here uh, every Tuesday and Thursday and uh, we do uh, every morning Peter puts out a blog a, a pre-market S&P uh, uh, blog and if you'd like to we do post it up in here but uh, Peter uh, while we do have you here and I know that we do have a lot of guests here. Can you just give us a little insight on jigsaw trading? Yeah, basically we're just a, a small company that uh, sells tools that help you read the order flow. Uh, plugins for Ninja Trader, OEC Trader, which is also known as S5 Trader, and lots of other names, Apex Trader. Um, we do a set of tools. Uh, people are welcome to uh, try those tools out. We have a 14-day money-back guarantee. If you don't like them, they're not for everybody. Uh, but what we also have on our web page, we have probably the best uh, order flow educational material available, or so I'm told, um, and that's all free. So if you go to the Jigsaw Trading website and click on Learn to Trade, um, it, you'll find the most comprehensive information for trading order flow around. All right, and uh, what I'll do here is uh, we'll post that in the room. So if you'd like to check it out, and uh, there it is. All right, Peter, well, we'll let you... Uh, uh, let you ease on to your evening. I know it's, gosh, it's almost midnight. Uh, your your chariot's going to turn into a pumpkin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah something's going to turn into a pumpkin. <laughs> well, I tell you, at 12 o'clock, you never know what's going to happen. So yeah. hopefully it's not a full moon by you, but uh, Peter, very nice to have you here once again. Uh, we'll catch you tomorrow. We'll talk to you tomorrow. And yep. have a great weekend. And uh, once again, remember the broadcast is free for our guests here uh, from bell to bell. Uh, join us. We have... Peter on every Tuesday and Thursday and lots of other good stuff. But, uh, Peter, thanks a lot, man. All right, cheers, Eddie, and thanks, everybody, for listening. All right. Thank you, sir. Take care, Peter. Okay, bye. Bye-bye.